Good morning. Now that is what I'm talking about, y'all. We didn't even have to do it again. That's awesome. It's great to have everyone with us this morning. We're, I'm excited especially to continue our series on Christ throughout the, all, all, throughout the ages, if you will. And this morning we're going to look at, at Christ uh, who was perfect on earth. We're going to look at it in some different aspects and we're going to look at it in some different ways. And I encourage you, if you will, to go ahead and start by opening to Luke chapter 4. Luke 4 has a lot of similarities to the same message that is taught in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, and some things are a little bit different as each of the gospel accounts focus or have a specific focus on a different aspect of Jesus' life. And so the account in Luke chapter 4 of Jesus' temptation uh, is going to be a little bit different from the one in Matthew chapter 4, which is probably a little bit more red, um, if you will. But uh, the one in Luke chapter 4 is beautiful within itself. And what it begins to show us in many different ways is that Christ was indeed perfect on this earth. And this morning what we're going to focus on is we're going to look at Christ's perfection upon this earth in three different ways or three different aspects in which we're going to look at it this morning. The first of which being that he was perfect within the eyes of God. That's why I've asked you to turn to Luke chapter 4. We'll get there in just a moment. The second of which is that we're going to look at the fact that Jesus was perfect in the eyes of the world or perfect within the eyes of man. This does not mean that people loved him completely and that everyone who encountered him was excited to encounter him. Some people hated Jesus. In fact, that ultimately led to his crucifixion. Uh, but at least somebody could say that anything that he had done was evil, wicked, or wrong. He was an innocent man when he was killed. So he was perfect in the eyes of God, perfect in the eyes of man. And then we'll, we will conclude this morning by focusing upon why it was important that Jesus was, in fact, perfect. What difference that makes in the important reasoning behind Jesus' perfection upon this earth, which gives us further reasoning for, or further understanding as to why we need to, to study such a topic. Let's begin by looking at Luke chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 13 and kind of get an idea as to what the, uh, the, the temptation of Jesus looked like uh, when he and, and the serpent, or he and Satan, if you will, the Satan, uh, were in, uh, in the wilderness. Verse 1 begins in Luke chapter 4 by saying such, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned to the Jordan, from the Jordan, excuse me, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for forty days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when he hit, when that had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said unto him, If you are the Son of God, command that this stone become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this authority, excuse me, I will give you, and their glory um, uh, I will give you. For this has been delivered unto me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Jesus answered and said, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And so he then brings him to Jerusalem, set him at the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash a foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said unto him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Um, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And now when the devil had, had ended every temptation... He departed from him until an opportune time. That, that phrase there right there at the end of verse 13, he departed from him until an oppor opportune time. Excuse me, for some reason that's a tough word for me to say this morning. For the right time or another time. Um, that, that moment gives us indication that although we have a, a, a collection of this temptation here in the wilderness, 40 days of fasting, is after his, uh, after his uh, baptism, has 40 days of fasting. He's not eating uh, anything. The devil begins to tempt him uh, in three different ways. He focuses on the physical by talking about commanding that this stone uh, be turned into bread. And then you can eat of that stone. The second of which was this concept, if you were to, to bow down to me, I would give you reign or, or authority over all things of this earth. And then the third of which, it focuses once again uh, upon uh, this this moment where he takes him to the pinnacle and says, jump off. The, angels will, will, uh, the Lord will not allow for the angels to not catch you so that your foot won't even uh, be hurt. Uh, and in each of these things, Jesus does something that is very important. I know we've talked about this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But each, in each of these moments, Jesus does something that is very important to his continuation of perfection. He continues to go back to the words of God. 
he continues to focus upon the words of the Lord. And in doing so, instead of yielding to the temptations that are placed before him, he overcomes these temptations. Why? Because even in the face of the lies of the devil, he focuses upon the word of God. And he does so to perfection. Not yielding to temptation. And that inclusion right there at the end of verse 13, he departed from him until an opportune time. There, I got it that time. Until an opportune time tells us that he was going to do this again. There were going to be more opportunities in which the devil would seek to tempt Jesus. And yet in each of these moments, Jesus reigns supreme and remains perfect. How do we know that? Well, because what was read for us by John just a moment ago in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. So because we have this great high priest, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us in our weakness. It's not as if Jesus doesn't understand the issues that we face. How does he understand the issues that we face? Well, because he was in all points tempted as we are. Yet in his temptation, he had no sin. Why? Because he did not yield to those temptations. He did not find himself in a position where he yielded to the temptations that were before him. So we have this great high priest that allows us to have confidence, that allows us to hold fast to the confession of our faith within him. Why? Because he was tempted in the same ways that we were. He's tempted with the lust of the flesh, lust of the, the, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And in each of these moments, he maintained his commitment unto the Lord by focusing upon his word. Which, of course, could get a, give us indication as to, okay, how, it is, how is it that we should be able to overcome these things? What should we do in these moments of temptation, in these moments of trials, that would allow for us to overcome these moments of weakness or temptation? Well, we focus on His Word. Jesus understood the will of the Lord. He understood that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of, of God. He understood that he should bow before nobody else but God Himself. And he also understood that he should not tempt the Lord, his God. And in each of these moments, because of his reflection upon the will of God, he was perfect in the eyes of God. And that's very important, and we're going to talk about that a little bit further. But let's pause for just a moment from looking at his perfection in the eyes of God and begin to focus on his perfection in the eyes of man. I don't know why I didn't put the word man up there. I guess it was my fault. Um, perfect in the eyes of man. You'll notice it, with each of Jesus' interactions or with each of Jesus' interactions, he does things quite differently than many other people do. In fact, when you begin to look at the interactions that he has with children, notice in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 19, it says, Then the little children were brought to him that he might put his hands upon them and pray. But notice the disciples, the followers of Jesus, the people who seek to become followers of Jesus, they rebuke these children. They rebuke the ones who were brought unto them. But Jesus said, Let the little children come unto me, and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands upon them and departed from there. You'll notice within their culture especially, there was not much significance placed upon children. We seem to place a lot more significance upon our children in, in today's culture than they did then, especially than they did then. Because then, it was, it was, uh, conversations were primarily, primarily meant for the adults. You had adult conversations, you had topics that would not be brought up in front of children. And as they got older, they would begin to be taught more things concerning the law, be welcomed into more conversations, this, that, and the other. Uh, but for children to come into the presence of the rabbi, well, that's a little bit strange, that's a little bit different. It's a little bit obscure for them to come into the presence of the teacher. And yet when those disciples begin to rebuke these children for entering into his presence and seeking to learn and seeking to, be benefit, to benefit from him, Jesus rebukes his disciples and says, let them come unto me. And then he gives this wonderful little message here. He says, let the children come to me. Do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus would mention in other places in Scripture that unless you become like one of these children, Unless you become as innocent or as, as filled with love for God as these little children, you would not be an inheritor of the kingdom of God. And so while others look to children as, as maybe lesser than, and others look to them as, as not important to give attention to, Jesus takes a moment and emphasizes not just their importance to him, but their importance within the kingdom, and some lessons that we as adults could learn from these children along the way. We also see Jesus in his dealings with the Samaritan woman. You'll notice in John chapter 4, Jesus enters into the city of Samaria. He's pat, he could have gone around as many Jewish people would, but Jesus instead chooses to go into the city of Samaria. He goes about midday, finds a woman at the well. And within this conversation with this woman at the well, a few things are revealed about this woman. 
Some things that that point us out that culturally she would not be accepted. She's there at midday, which gives indication there's probably a reason why she's there at midday. Most people would go in the mornings, get their water uh, so that they could have it for the day. But this woman's there midday. And upon having a further conversation, we might begin to see a little bit why. He begins to tell her things that uh, that he himself would not be able to know unless he was from God. He begins to, to reveal some things unto her. He says in verse 15, uh, excuse me, um, yeah, verse 15, the woman said, Sir, give me this water. He was talking to her about this, this water that would cause for her to never thirst again. And she says unto him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. And Jesus said, Go call your husband and come here. And she answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said, You have said well that you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom with you are now with is not your husband. And that you spoke truly. And the woman said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Jesus was perfected within his love towards all. Even finding those who are outcasts in communities because of their sinful ways. Because of their sinful actions. Some things that this woman had done had made her to be outcast among her community. And Jesus goes to her and asks for her to give him some water. And then promises her. And shows her a water that would never run dry and never cause for her to thirst again. One of my favorite moments in in John chapter 4, it's one of my favorite moments in Jesus' teachings, is the moment in which you see the the coming of many people out of the city of Samaria because of the actions of this very woman. The one who was outcast by her community goes into the community as the one to proclaim the message of Jesus. And as a result, many became believers in Jesus because Jesus took the time to focus upon somebody else that no one would ever give attention to. Jesus didn't just do that because of people in their sinful ways or didn't just focus on people who were outcast because of their sinful ways. Jesus focused on people who were outcast because of their uh, physical inabilities or their sicknesses and illnesses. For example, in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1-4, through 4, we see Jesus' dealings with a leper. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said unto him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer your gift that Moses had commanded as a testimony unto them. There's so, so much there in Matthew chapter 8. There's, you, you get this little statement there right at the end, go and give your, your uh, gift at the altar, or go and make your gift that Moses has commanded. That's a, that's a, a cleansing offering. It was part of the ritual of cleansing for a leper. Now, the, the, the only issue was is that typically there were some more sacrifices and some more things that had to be done first in order to heal them of their leprosy. But in order for them to be seen in and amongst the community again as clean, there would also have to be a, a gift offered that Moses commanded, given within uh, Leviticus. There would also have to be a, an offering made so that they could be seen as clean once again by their community. Okay, all the other ones were not necessary. Why? Because Jesus himself healed this man. And Jesus healed this man of his leprosy. And then says, go and give your gift at the altar, the one that that Moses had commanded, as a testimony unto them, as a showing unto them that you are seen as clean. Now Jesus did this in a very weird way. If you'll notice, Jesus reached out and touched him. I don't know if you've ever read much about the dealings of of the uh, people in the old law and lepers, but that's a real big no-no. That's a a huge deal for, for somebody to touch a leper. There were leper colonies so that they wouldn't come in contact with others who were clean. If you were to touch a leper, you would be seen immediately as unclean, whether or not you had leprosy or not. And you'd have to go through the whole ritual of cleansing that the lepers would have to go through. And yet Jesus reaches out his hands and says that he is willing and that this man should be cleansed. And immediately this leprosy leaves him. And so he goes and tells him to go and make this offering. He'll be seen as clean once again within the community. This is, so it shows that Jesus was not just perfect in the eyes of God. But he was also perfect in his love. He showed uh, love and care for those who were outcast by their community or maybe not seen as equal within their community. Like children. He exalted them and and said, such is the kingdom of God. Like the Samaritan woman, the woman who had lived a life of sin, and yet she became the one who would go into the city of Samaria and and proclaim the message of the teachings of Jesus. While his disciples were going and seeking after some food. And now this leper who would have been seen as outcast from the community, seen as unclean, seen as unfit to even go and worship the Lord, and yet Jesus makes him clean. Or Zacchaeus, in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, of course we all know the story of Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. 
He climbed up in a sycamore tree to see what he could see. And Jesus witnesses this tax collector. This man who would have been seen as a traitor in his community. And he decides to go into his house to show his love unto him. And as a result, Zacchaeus commits his life further unto the Lord. And a further result from that is that he seeks to make right all the wrongs that he has done within his life. Jesus was perfect in the eyes of man because he looked at those who others would ignore. He looked at those that others would show hatred to, and he instead showed love. And the saddest reality of each of these things is that even though he was perfect, without blame, without sin, even in the eyes of man, they killed him because they did not want to become a follower of him because they thought that he was a blasphemer. Matthew chapter 26, verses 59 through 66. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But notice this, but they found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it back in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Do you answer nothing? What is, these, uh, what, it, what is it these men testify against you? Notice, but Jesus keeps silent. And the high priest answered and said, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of a witness? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, He is deserving of death. This man who lived a perfect sinless life, God in the flesh, who did nothing wrong, was sentenced to death because they did not believe his teachings concerning himself as the Messiah. They did not believe that, his, his, that he himself was the true Messiah. So why is this important for us to look at? Why is it important that we see that he was perfect in the eyes of God? That we see that he was perfect in the eyes of man? What, what importance is there to the perfection that Jesus lived upon this earth? Well, let's look at, at three different places. And then the lesson will be yours. Three different places I want us to look at. First of which is Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4. Second of which is Exodus 12 and verse 4 through 5. And then Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. The first of which being Hebrews eleven four, 4. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and though it, he, uh, excuse me, though it be he being dead still speaks. Exodus chapter 12, verses 4 through 5. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's seed, and you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives as just as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word, and that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. When each of these accounts, you might say, okay, what in the world is, that? is he talking about? He's talking about this, this more excellent gift in Hebrews 11. He's talking about the, the not being able to provide for yourself, your own household, a lamb, and others helping you within this sacrifice in, in Exodus chapter 12. And in Ephesians chapter 5, he's talking about marriage. What in the world do these three things have to do with Christ being perfect? Notice with each of these sacrifices, it was to be the perfect, blemish, blemishless uh, uh, perfect sacrifice of a lamb. In Hebrews chapter 11, by, by talking about this, this faith, this, many refer to Hebrews 11 as the, the hall of fame of faith, if you will. This faith, which is spoken of, of Abel, led him to give a more excellent or a more perfect, as some translations say, sacrifice in the eyes of the Lord. One that was without spot or blemish. Exodus chapter 12, once again we see the importance of the need for this lamb to be without spot and without blemish. And Jesus himself, as we see in Ephesians chapter 5, Jesus himself was offered as the perfect sinless sacrifice without spot or without blemish. The use of the Old Testament lamb the use of the Old Testament sacrifices were not just to put off the sins temporarily until the coming of Jesus, but it was used to point to the coming of Jesus. 
A day when a perfect, sinless man who is God in the flesh would come to this earth and give his life, a life of perfection in exchange for ours. He gave his life upon the cross as that perfect, sinless lamb so that we could have a hope of redemption through his blood, so that we could have a hope of eternity through his blood. And in doing so, offering up the perfect sacrifice, perfect in the eyes of God, perfect in the eyes of man, perfect within his sacrifice, we can be made whole, we can be made complete, and we can be made perfect. Now, the challenge for us this morning is to be as perfect as we can be. <laughs> you know, and talk about our practices at times that we have. That's a little bit of an easier said than done, is it not? Be as perfect as you can be. But there is a way in which we can be made perfect. Because of that perfect, sinless sacrifice of Christ. Because of that, imp- that, that uh, perfect sacrifice in which he gave upon this earth. Because of all those wonderful and amazing acts of love that he did that made him to be whole and complete and perfect. And because of the most amazing act of love that he did in giving his life upon the cross for our sins. We can be made whole, made complete, and made perfect through his blood. But it is only through that sacrifice that we can be made whole, complete, and perfect. So our practice this morning is to be perfect. And if that means that this morning what you need to do to be made perfect is to wash away your sins with the waters of baptism, then do so. If you've never put on Christ in baptism, you cannot be seen as perfect in the eyes of the Lord. You cannot stand before Him on Judgment Day with a great confidence. Or maybe it's the case this morning that you have been a baptized believer, but you've fallen away. You've done things that are not righteous. You've done things that have made you to once again be made imperfect. Repent. Change. Live a life committed unto the Lord. Seeking always to do His will so that you can be seen as perfect. Or maybe it's the case this morning that what you need to be doing is going and make more disciples. Maybe you need encouraging. Maybe you need strengthening. Maybe you need some uplifting. And some reminding that you can go and help somebody else to be a partaker of that wonderful sacrifice that makes each of them, makes each of us perfect through the blood that he shed for us. If it's the case this morning that you need to respond to the Lord's invitation and be made whole, be made complete, and be made perfect or encourage, help to encourage others to be made perfect, please come while we stand and while we sing.